Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. The text that we are studying today comes from the end of Galatians 3 and the beginning of Galatians 4. So I'll read the text and then we can study it. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or f- and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This is God's word, and if you'd like to, you can pull up the Bible tab on this page right now to follow along with this section of Galatians 3 and 4, as I'll be making references to it throughout the sermon. Do you know how many words are in this book? (laughs) Obviously, it depends on what English translation of the Bible you're using, but you're going to get anywhere from 750,000 to 800,000 words in an English Bible. That's a lot of words. (laughs) And because there are so many words, the Bible can be kind of an intimidating book, can't it? Uh, For those who don't yet call themselves Christians, the the Bible can be like the worst reading assignment ever. If you're expecting me to join your religion and there's required reading and it's 800,000 words long, (laughs) it's no wonder many people don't pick up the Bible at all. And besides that, the Bible can be a difficult book to understand sometimes. The language isn't language that we're used to. The contexts are, in some cases, a couple thousand years old. It can be a hard book to get into. But even for those of us who would call ourselves Christians, these 800,000 words can be a little bit intimidating. I wonder if you've had a moment like this. I know I have where either a question from a friend or a family member comes up or something happens in your life and you know in the back of your head, the Bible says something about that. But you don't know where to look. And so you maybe go on a a rabid Google search (laughs) to find that Bible verse and maybe you find it, maybe you don't. But you kind of just wish you knew the answers, don't you? Well, thankfully for you, Martin Luther wanted you to have those answers, and so he wrote them down. Not that he added anything to the scripture, but what Martin Luther did is create a resource that allows us to answer every question that anyone has about the Bible. And that little book was called His Small Catechism. Now, I think there's two reactions that people have when they hear the word catechism. The first of those is to remember those long nights when you were in seventh or eighth grade where you had already gone to school for a whole day and you were required to sit in a class with your pastor for another hour or maybe two to study a thing called the catechism. Or maybe some of you don't even know what a catechism is, but you're pretty sure it sounds like something that happens to your cardiovascular system before you die. (laughs) And that's pretty typical. Now, the word catechism doesn't exactly incite excitement. It doesn't get people to the edge of their seats. But the catechism is one of the most beautiful things that our church has. If you didn't know, catechism is actually not that hard of a word to understand. It's a combination of two Greek words, kata or kat, which means again, and echo, which means, you guessed it, to repeat. And so the word catechism simply means to repeat something again. And truthfully, every one of us has a catechism. We maybe don't have it in a book form, but we have those things that we repeat again and again. They're the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. There may be the principles that we live by or, or the principles that we're trying to help other people in the world to live by. They're the things that we repeat because when you repeat things, they become more 
true, they become more you. You internalize them, you make them part of yourself, and, and that's because that's how you were made. If you're a Christian, you know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth by his word. He spoke everything into existence, and the crown of his creation were human beings, Adam and Eve. He made them also with words, but then he did something really special. He gave them words. Everything he had created up to this point was without words. Sure, the animals could communicate to each other, but they didn't have words like Adam and Eve had words. And those words brought clarity to their relationships and brought a special relationship between them and God. Any psychologist or counselor will tell you that maybe the greatest value of counseling is words. Like being able to speak words because it forces your brain to take abstract concepts or feelings and put them into concrete words. And often that brings a lot more clarity to the way that you're feeling. So, since every one of us has a catechism, every one of us has something that we're telling ourselves regularly, why not make it what God wants us to tell ourselves? What God wants us to repeat regularly. And so we're having this series called Echo, which of course is borrowed from the word catechism. It's a series I hope to do every year as we study one of the six parts of Martin Luther's small catechism. And this year we're going to study the Lord's Prayer. You know, the interesting thing about prayer is that just about everyone does it. Every world religion has some concept of prayer, and even many people who aren't religious or even atheist will pray. You know this, whenever there's a tragedy that happens, very often on Facebook or on the news, you'll hear someone say, we're sending our thoughts and our prayers. Maybe you've said this or heard someone say this to you when, when you tell them something is going wrong in your life. They say, well, we'll pray for you, even if they're not a Christian. But here's the interesting thing. Despite the fact that almost everyone in the world has a concept of prayer, and very few people would say that prayer is a bad thing, I believe almost none of us feel very confident in prayer. Whether you're a Christian or some other religion, or you're not religious at all, And whether you've been in that state of belief for a long time or a short time, very few of us, I think, feel confident in prayer. And I think that's because of a number of different reasons. For some of us, it was the fact that we prayed and it seemed like nothing happened. And maybe that was you. You prayed for some financial relief, or you prayed for some health benefit, or you prayed for another person. You prayed that God would heal your grandma or your uncle. You prayed that you'd get through this situation unharmed. You you prayed for your child, and, and well, it seemed like God didn't answer. And so you wonder to yourself, am I doing this right? Am Am I asking for the wrong things? Am I asking in the wrong way? And you lost confidence in prayer. I wonder if for some of you, it's the fact that you pray, but then other people seem to get more answers than you. You pray and God seems to answer some of your prayers, but then you look at this other person and they seem super spiritual and their prayers are seeming to be always answered. They're saying things like, yeah, I just prayed and And there it was, God provided me whatever I needed. You're praying for things like maybe you want to find a Christian spouse, or maybe you want to find a new job, or or maybe you want to find an escape from whatever your problem is, and it seems like God is giving answers to everyone else except you. And so you've lost confidence in prayer. Maybe for some of you, it's the fact that you're just distracted. The world is a busy place, 
And after a hard day of work and being with your family, you'd much rather just knock off and, and watch a few episodes of Netflix than focus on talking to your father in heaven. And it's not that you've disregarded prayer or that you think prayer doesn't work. You just, you've lost confidence in its importance in your life. Or maybe for some of you, it's the fact that it just doesn't feel right. Like from a practical point of view, maybe you're one of those people who just doesn't feel confident praying. You would make the time for it and you trust that God would answer. But when it comes to actually formulating the words, you're not really sure what words to say. Maybe you're scared to pray in public. Maybe you're not sure if you're supposed to fold your hands or close your eyes or bow your knees or what those things actually mean. And so from a practical point of view, prayer just feels weird. Or maybe it's from a theological point of view. Like you think to yourself, I mean, God knows everything and, and God knows what I need. Why would I pray? I feel like I'm just being redundant. <laughs> and so you've lost confidence in prayer. What I'd like to do is venture a guess as to why so many of us feel so unconfident when it comes to prayer. And that is that maybe the way that we think about prayer is not the way God thinks about prayer. I was meditating on this this week as I was preparing for this message. I was thinking about prayer and I, I was thinking about how much of a part of our culture it is. Everybody seems to pray in one way or another. And then I thought about Satan. Why isn't Satan stopping that? Satan's trying to stop the preaching of the gospel. Satan is trying to stop people from loving their neighbors self-sacrificially. Satan is trying to stop people from following God's law. And yet it seems like Satan is not stopping anyone from praying. And then I thought, what if it's because we've got prayer all wrong? And Satan's just fine with that. See, we are not the first people to ask the question, how do we pray? We're not the first people to be unconfident in prayer. And we're not the last, the first or last people whom Satan will try to deceive to think that we've understood prayer when we really have not. And that's why the Lord's Prayer is so wonderful. See, the Lord's Prayer was Jesus' answer to the question his disciples asked about how to pray. Now they saw Jesus and they, they said, this guy's different. He seems to understand prayer in a way that we don't. So they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, okay, here's how you should pray. Now, before we get into the study of the actual words of the Lord's Prayer, which we're going to do over the next couple weeks, I want to settle one debate right up front. Have you ever had this happen where well, you've been going to a church and all of a sudden, someone tries to change the words of the Lord's Prayer. Or maybe it's your church that's trying to use a little bit more modern wording. Or maybe you go to another church and you hear them say the Lord's Prayer and you, you think that's not the right way to say it. Do you know where, where that changing of the words came from? It actually goes way back, all the way back to Jesus. Jesus was the first person to change the words. Now, did you know this, that the Bible records the Lord's Prayer in two places, in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11, and in both places, Jesus uses different words. And the reason that we have two gospel writers who record the Lord's Prayer, I think, teaches us some profound things about the Lord's Prayer as a unit. First of all, if you were to look into Matthew's account of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus starts answering the question to his disciples by saying, this then is how you should pray. In other words, he says, this is the method. This is the manner. This is the outline. These are the thoughts that you should cover. I don't necessarily have to use these words. This is, this is just how you should pray. And yet when, when Luke records Jesus' words about the Lord's Prayer, he says that Jesus started his answer to his disciples by saying, when you pray, say this. In other words, that Jesus is saying, look, 
if you're going to pray anything, pray these words. And from both of those accounts together, we see what God wants us to learn about prayer. That there is a specific set of words that God has given us that we ought to say. And that's the Lord's Prayer. We say it every Sunday. And the words change as language modernizes, but those same concepts, those same exact words are there. And yet, on the other hand, not every prayer needs to be the Lord's Prayer, but simply modeled after the Lord's Prayer. Thinking about the petitions that Jesus has given us as we bring into those prayers the problems of our everyday life, the requests, the the worries, the concerns that we have. And so we learn from both Matthew and Luke, how God wants us to regard the Lord's Prayer. So let's dig into what the prayer actually says. And today we're going to take on the address of the prayer, which is our Father in heaven. And we're going to take uh, three points from this uh, section of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to talk about how, first of all, if we do not understand these first few words, then we cannot understand God. Second, we can't understand ourselves. And third, we cannot grow as Christians. So first, we cannot know God if we do not understand the words, our Father in heaven. Now, I know it's Mother's Day, but I want all parents to to think through these questions with me. The first of those is, how much do you love your kids? I'm sure that's a really hard question for you to answer. Because as you start to think about how much you love your kids, it's almost impossible to put into words, isn't it? To try to describe what it feels like that first time that you hold your child in your hands, it's quite a task. But I'm guessing that that ever since that moment, your love has grown and become even more indescribable. Can I ask you another question? How much do you think about your kids? You know, the thing that parents do is they kind of obsess about their kids. And of course, there's a certain level of obsession that is unhealthy, but even really good parents are sort of obsessed with their kids. They'll do things for their kids that they would do for no one else. They do things for their kids that they would do for no one else's kids. Things like bathing them, tucking them in at night, holding them while they scream at you, getting them food even though they don't ask politely, you're willing to do things for your kids that you would do for no one else. And it keeps growing, doesn't it? As your kids get a little bit older, you go to sports games where you mostly see your kids sit on the bench or dance recitals or piano recitals that Well, they're honestly ugly at best, but to you, they're beautiful and you want to be there. You take artwork that should probably be thrown in the garbage and you put it up on the fridge like it's a masterpiece. And you train those children to do all sorts of things that you would never take the time to train somebody else. From potty training, to riding a bike, to cleaning up after themselves, you take hours and hours to help your children. And it keeps growing when they get older, doesn't it? When they get to their preteen or their teenage years, you'll spend ridiculous amounts of money on them, whether it's for braces or for sports camps or for all the clothes that they need or the seemingly unending amount of food that they can consume. (laughs) And you'll take time to drive them just about anywhere they need to go. And you'll, you'll be with them, you'll be patient with them when they're going through pubescent mood swings. And, and you'll sit with them when they're worried about things that you know that by the time they're 20 or 30, they will forget about and will not matter at all. Yeah, I'm sure you think a lot about your kids. Let me ask you another question. How much would you sacrifice for your kids? I wonder if the top two answers to that question wouldn't be either anything or my life. See, parents, we want to give up things for our children because we love them so much. We'll sacrifice 
We will sacrifice time or money or energy or sleep or intimacy with our spouse or our own happiness. We'll buy things that we would never thought we would have bought. We'll sacrifice buying the things we wish we would have bought. We'll, we'll take time that was, should have been for ourselves and spend it on our kids. We'll sacrifice anything. And if it ever came to it, we would even sacrifice our lives, wouldn't we? Now, let me ask you one last question. What if God's like that? Because when Jesus told us to pray, he told us to say, our father. Did you know God vividly remembers holding you in his arms for the first time? Do you remember or do you know that, that God remembers every time you were tucked in, every time you screamed at him or at your parents? He remembers every need that you've ever had, and he's made a way to provide for it. He's been with you when you weren't asking for things politely and, and weren't saying thank you. He's been with you when you had those mood swings you had your rebellious phase. He sees the things that you do. And while most of the world would scoff at them and say, that's worthless. I don't have time for that. God puts it on the fridge. Like it's the most beautiful thing that he's seen. See, when Jesus told us to pray, he told us to pray to our father. And that's what the Apostle Paul was trying to get us to think about as he wrote the end of Galatians 3 and the beginning of Galatians 4. Do you remember the words? He said, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. See, at one time we were distanced from God. We were not loved by him. We were his enemies. But because of what Jesus did on the cross and because of our baptism, we were made children of God. We could look to him as a father. As one who cares about every moment of our life. As one who is obsessed in a way with our well-being and and yet I don't think that's how many of us think about God. Tell me, when, when you pray to God, what do you envision? Do you envision sort of an ethereal power source out there somewhere? Do you maybe envision a king sitting on his throne? Do you maybe think of him almost like a well, sort of a vending machine that I say the right words and he, he's going to do that thing that I'm asking for. Or do you think about him as a father? Do you think about him as someone who wants in every way to provide for you everything good? Do you think about him as one who thinks constantly of you? Of one who's always been there? See, if, if we know that God is our father, then it helps us understand God. More often than not, I wonder if the breakdowns in our relationship with God have more to do with our perception of God than anything else. We look at God and we think of him like a king or a, a tyrant or a ruler. And yes, he is a king and he is a ruler and he does have power over us. And yet he has revealed himself to us as a father. But he's not just a father. He's our father. And if we don't understand that he is our father and we won't be able to understand ourselves. See, there are two things that we learn when Jesus starts his prayer with our father. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter four, 
Now, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Do you know how adoption worked in the first century AD? It was very different from what we think of as adoption today. See, in that day, adoption was based more on performance than on the love and generosity of a couple parents. See, adoption was something that rich Roman men would do in order to pass on their inheritance if they had no sons. And so very often, if a rich man had no son to inherit his estate, he would legally adopt maybe his most trusted servant or another man that he trusted very highly to be that heir. He would give all of his wealth to that man because he couldn't give it to a daughter and he had no son to give it to. See, when, when the Romans thought of adoption, they thought of the best and the brightest and the smartest and the strongest. But when God thinks of adoption, he thinks of something very different. See, Jesus tell, or God tells us that when Jesus came into the world, he came so that we could receive adoption into sonship. And it wasn't because we were the best or the brightest or the strongest or the most good looking or the most accomplished. No, many of us, in fact, Paul says all of us were, were weak, were unintelligent, were considered fools by the world when God made us his sons and daughters. See, in the Roman world, adoption was based on resources and ability, but not so with God. Now, God says through Paul in Galatians 3 that for him, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what he's saying there is when it comes to your adoption into the family of God, it's not like Roman adoption, where only men got adopted, only based on performance, and only if they could carry on the estate of a rich man. No, all of a sudden, men and women, regardless of sex, were brought into the family. And regardless of ethnicity, and regardless of status in the world, and regardless of ability, God made us his children so that he could be our father. See, God is our father by choice. All of us have a father who is not our father by choice. And some of us were very blessed through that man. And some of us have a terrible relationship with that man. But the father who chose to be our father, who picked us when, when there was nothing good in us to pick, that God, that father, he has made you his children. But there's a second aspect to our father that is so powerful. And that's that he's our father. See, Jesus, when he said the prayer, he didn't say, pray my father. No, he said, pray our father. And this ought to help you think through the community relationship that the church naturally has. God has made it very clear that the church is not a bunch of individuals who have individual relationships with him, regardless of the Christian community around them. No, God assumes that every Christian will be in Christian community. God assumes that prayers will be said as a community. God assumes that you will be in each other's lives. That's what it means to be brothers and sisters under a father. Let me ask it to you like this. Let's say you were riding in a car with your brother or your sister and you got in a terrible accident. As the dust settled, would you first start to think about the car or about your brother or sister? 
Every one of us would think about our brother or sister. We would call to them. We would look to them. We would reach out to them. But now I wonder, is that how we live when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Maybe it's not a car accident, but, but when a virus threatens our health or our economy or our comfort, do we first worry about our budget or our plans or our feelings? Or do we reach out to our brothers and sisters? As we think about being a church, are we more concerned with what the church can provide me? or with how I can serve the people of the church. In a North American world where church very often is either popular or unpopular based on the production value, God says the church is the people. And being a Christian is inextricably tied to your Christian community. Right now, We can't say our father in the same room, but someday we will. Someday we'll be back together and we will say our father in heaven. And I hope that as we say those words, your ears perk up, your mind flashes with images of your best friends in faith. As you look around that room and we pray together, our father in heaven. See, if we don't understand our Father in heaven, then we cannot understand ourselves. We can't understand the type of relationship that we have with God and the type of relationship that we have with each other. See, first, with our relationship with God, if we are going to be in God's family, that changes how we interact with him. It changes how we see ourselves. You know, you can live in someone's house, but you can have two very different relationships with that someone. On the one hand, you could have the relationship of tenant and landlord. You're living in their house, but the relationship is based on contractual obligations. They keep up their half of the bargain, you keep your half of the bargain, and the relationship is just fine. But if your family... If you're a son, you're a daughter, then you stay in someone's house with no obligation, rent-free, despite the fact that in many ways, you're a terrible tenant. (laughs) So which is it between you and God? Is God the big man upstairs? Is he the king? Or is he your father? And then second, if we don't understand our father, then we don't understand our relationship with each other. That we all, equally born into sin, but then equally redeemed through baptism, together come to our father to pray to him and to receive his gifts. Not one of us more or less important than another. Regardless of status or ethnicity or sex or age, we are all sons and and daughters of God. But he's not just our father. He's our father in heaven. And that teaches us how to truly change and how prayer can truly change us. You know, your father had a profound effect on you. Whether you had a good relationship with your father or a bad relationship with your father, he had a profound effect on who you are and how you operate, didn't he? For those of you who had good fathers, you looked up to that man as an example of how to to love a wife, how to love children, how to work hard, how to be faithful, how to be patient, how to be sacrificial. And you wanted to emulate those things, didn't you? You wanted to be that kind of father. Or you wanted to find that kind of man to marry. Because you had a great father. And some of you had had a terrible relationship with your father. 
And you've been taking every opportunity since you got out of your house to do everything in your power not to turn out like your father. I bet every one of you could look at your behavior right now, the things that you value, the way that you think, and notice that in many ways it has been influenced by who your father was. But the truth is it it wears off, doesn't it? While we're still affected by our father's good and bad right now, as you get older, you start to forget or you start to maybe get a little bit over the things that your father did to you or did against you. And even for good fathers, those good fathers aren't around all the time. Eventually you move out of their house. Eventually they die and you can't call them on the phone anymore. The truth is, even earthly fathers, they have a limited effect on who we are as a person. But not your father in heaven. See, because your father is in heaven, he can do what no earthly father can. He can always be there. He can never miss a moment. And where even your good fathers have failed you, he can be perfect. He can be emotionally intelligent. He can be present. He can be faithful. He can be loving. He can be compassionate in ways that even good fathers could not be. He can define you in a way that you have never been defined before. He can love you in a way that makes you seek after no one else's love. He can be faithful to you in a way that makes you crave no one else's faithfulness. And as you realize that love that your father in heaven has for you, it can truly change you. You know, Paul gets our minds around this when he writes in verse six of chapter four, it says, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba father. You know, the word Abba is kind of an interesting word. There's a reason that it's, it's not translated because there really isn't a solid English equivalent to that word. Uh, The commentators and pastors that I've read and listened to on this topic say that Abba is probably most closely equivalent to maybe the word Papa. Like, it's not childish, like Daddy, but it's not really dissociated, like maybe some adults talk about their parents, like my dad. There's an endearment there, there's a respect there, but it's also a term that you would use for your father, whether you're three or you're 23 or you're 53. In other words, as Paul writes these words, he's saying to us, because we are his sons, we have the ability to call out to him as a father, no matter what stage of life we are in. Because he's tender and kind, like the father of a three-year-old. And, and he's patient and forgiving like the father of a teenager. And he's wise like the father of our adult years. And he's all of those things all at the same time so that when we come to him with our prayers, we know that they will be answered. We know that they will be heard with a heart of empathy. And we know that they will be answered in the way that God, our father, sees best for us. So when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, and meditate on each of those words, our, not my, not his, not your, our Father, our Father, our loving, faithful, kind, compassionate, generous, funny Father. In heaven forever where he's going to bring us to be home with him if you're a father or mother think about your kids and then know that God loves you more than a hundred times more because he's our father in heaven let's pray Our Father, 
you are good and you are kind and you're generous. And just the thought of you brings a smile to my face and warmth to my heart. Because I know as you look back on my life, you've seen all the ways that I've messed up. You've seen all the ways that I haven't taken your advice, the ways that I've disobeyed you, and yet you're still my father. And you're not just my father, you're our father. Our congregation's father. Our little congregation who is bootstrapping all the time and trying to figure out how to be Lutheran in a world that doesn't want to hear your word. I'm so glad you're our father. And I'm so glad you're our father in heaven. That you're not limited to one space or one time. That you're not limited in your intelligence and your compassion. And that you're always there. So I pray that we as a congregation would come to you as our father when we pray. Work that in in us by the power of your Holy Spirit who leads us to call out Abba. Amen.